And we are live. You are live. It's alive. Good morning, friends and family, and welcome to another Saturday Coffee and Conversation with me, Erin Mahone. Your, if you could see me, uh, I, I don't know, whatever I am, the 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 guy at the at the thing. Um, I. <laughs> The I am so the excited. The thing is the thing. I'm so excited this morning to uh, to be joined once again by my friend, by our, if you could see me, family member, by the ineffable Melissa Early. Welcome to the show, my friend. Good to be back. It's good How to are be you? back. This Saturday How am morning. I? Yes. Let's see. And it's okay. I... It's okay to be honest and it's okay to just say whatever you want. How am I? I am here. Yes. I am right here in this moment. I am pretty okay. Awesome. I'll let you know if it changes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You'll be the first to know. <laughs> I appreciate that. I do. Uh, you know, I, I think that if we, uh, if we can find some way of like staying in the moment, we can realize that most of the time we are okay. I don't know, you know, I don't think it's fair to say that we're good. I don't think it's fair to say that, you know, things are awesome, but in the moment we are okay. In mm -hmm. most cases, good morning, Sandy Tobias. <gasps> Sandy says, good morning to you, dear ladies. Um, yeah. So we are here this morning to talk about, I think one of your favorite topics and that is advocacy. Yes. So, you know, you, you are sort of like the queen of advocacy. And uh, I know you love it when I do that, right? Uh, well, you're just really good at it. And you're really good at using your experience and you have a lot of knowledge. And um, so tell us sort of, I, you know, I, I think we could talk for a hundred hours, but tell us the role that advocacy sort of plays in your life and how it became a part of, you know, your identity. Wow. Um, tell us your whole life story right now. No. Okay. So Don't. I was born <laughs> in a hospital that no longer exists. <laughs> um, and could we process and if that you a had bit? If you had been older, then you would have made sure that hospital didn't go away. Well, I was I was around. It just kind of moved and changed names. So I'm kind of okay with that. I'll be okay. <laughs> okay, good. good. Um, so we can move on to the real topic now. Um, <laughs> but um, no, so I think advocacy kind of um, became something that I kind of had to do. When I was a kid for myself, um, right. I really didn't know that's what I was doing. Right. Um, and I probably could have honed my technique a little bit better. Um, Cause kind of the way I started out was just to act out um, right. and yes. to get attention and to get my needs met because that's, kind of what a lot of kids do to get what they need because they don't really know how to use the right verbiage to say, you know, hey, things are kind of sucking right now. I need your help to help. make them unsuck. Right. And I didn't really know how to say that. I didn't know how to talk about the real issues. So I just did a lot to rock the boat until somebody decided they wanted us a, a like nice, smooth sailing boat. So they had to focus on Melissa to make the boat stop rocking. And that was kind of me advocating for myself unknowingly. Um, Melissa, wait, I, and I hate to interrupt you, but I feel like that, 
that may be one of the most powerful things that anybody can hear. Okay. And, you know, as a therapist, as a person who works in, you know, the mental health field, um, who with kids, you, I mean, you know, who has done this for, for many, many years, um, has been a first responder, all of that stuff, a nurse, um, self-advocacy sometimes looks like rocking right? the boat like behavior manipulation which is a terrible word that we do not want to use except that when we use the word manipulation what we're really saying is that this person is just using what they have exactly. to get what they need it's what they know right and when we place judgment and label and blame and 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 say that's a problem kid or they have issues or they're, they're it dismisses their seeking. needs right it dismisses the need it dismisses what's actually happening which is that this person is trying to communicate that they are in trouble and they need you to help them they are screaming for help right and if someone is attention seeking give them the give attention, them attention. Right. please right. give them the attention and but Once you don't you... have to give it to them in the way that they're asking for it. Right. Well, give them the attention, mm -hmm. figure out what's behind the behavior. Right. And, you know, what's going on that is, you know, not what's wrong with you, but, you know, what happened to you. That's the whole premise exactly. of trauma-informed care. Exactly. You know, find out what the need is, address the need, and then help them learn how to appropriately ask for their needs to be met bingo but first you have to address the need mm -hmm. because they're not going to be in a position to learn anything new until you get them out of the storm that is causing their boat to rock because they're not the ones rocking the boat in reality right you know it's it they're, they come to the environment where the, the boat isn't rocking and rock that boat to draw attention to wherever the, the boat is in the storm is, and right. constantly like it's ready to capsize. Right. And, you know, it's so important. You know, you're right. It's, it's crucially important to understand that when you're working with kids, adults, you know, it's it's more frequently that that goes on with kids, but even with adults, if you've never learned the the right. the tools, the communication techniques, or whatever, if you've never had the opportunity to have someone teach you that, it's not something that you know you're you're born with and it develops over time. Right. It's something that has to be taught, and you may get into you know early adulthood middle ages you know my age i'm definitely past middle ages <laughs> um and not know that those, those skills and and you may still be using actions instead of words to communicate your needs right and don't judge that if that's the case with someone you know <laughs> i i teach a, a class um on like aces and and trauma-informed care and, and aces is adverse childhood experiences for anybody um, who doesn't know it's an assessment that no, determines cards <laughs> Spade, Spades, she's right. I'm sorry. right yes um no like uh it is an assessment that was developed in the late 90s to you know help people uh, help help doctors and professionals understand the underlying ch childhood trauma that um you know individuals have experienced because there's a direct connection between adverse childhood experiences and you know it, mental health issues for sure but also you Physical. know medical issues that um you know pop up later Later in life. And so, sorry, just want to yeah. make sure people know. Thank you. I, I often for, forget that, you know, it's just not common knowledge, but if it were, right. I wouldn't have to teach the classes. That's right. That I love exactly. to teach. Um, exactly. So, but yeah. And, and when I, when I teach that course um, and it, when you take the assessment, it's the, the regular assessment, it's 10 um, 
things that, you know, and there, some of them are as simple as, um, you know, did you witness violence or, right. you know, did you have a parent that, um, yelled a lot? In, yeah, exactly. That, and that violence is, you know, yelling and, you know, did you come from a broken home? You know, did your parents mm -hmm. divorce, you know, things like that as a child, you know, did, um, substance use in your home, things like that. And so you get, you know, one point for each of those and there's 10 questions and um it's like if we all kind of wore our ace score on our shirt right. i think we'd be nicer to each other mm -hmm. <laughs> you right. know because it's like you would you would know that you know we're we're not walking around you know being you know, a jerk for no reason. And I, that didn't come out really good, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? It's like, right. you know, if, if somebody cuts you off in traffic, you have no idea the why behind that. You have no idea. You know, they may be rushing to the hospital because they found out their loved one was in a horrible accident. Mm -hmm. You know, you have no idea. And, and I really try to remember that. Um, I'm not always great at it. Sometimes I, I, I wave at them with one finger. Um, but most of the time I do a pretty <laughs> good job of just, right. you know, taking a deep breath and being like, you know, right. I don't know where they're going. Day. I don't right. know. Right. So it's right. And you know, it's interesting because, and this sort of takes a, a turn, but, um, you know, I, I think that there is a way to acknowledge one another's humanity in this way that you know we're discussing and also hold people accountable and i right. think that there is this this like this really sort of dichotomous thinking in our culture that says if i give someone compassion for their bad day or for the boat that's rocking that maybe i don't know um it it somehow is an excuse or excuses their their mm -hmm. poor behavior and that I'm saying, oh, well, we should just let them do all the things that they're doing. And so, you know, it's always to me really important to both say, you know, while we sh we're saying be compassionate, be aware what happened in, in your life. How can, you know, I support you in getting what you need and being heard and seen in a way that is, you know, meaningful for you. And you can't act like this. Right. That's very true. I mean, after I, I did that <laughs> wonderful advocacy for myself um, in, I think it was like seventh grade is, is when it really came to a, um, I guess, a head. Um, I was very much held accountable for my... <laughs> advocacy um <laughs> quote there, and quote, my, quote my and finger quotes around advocacy, advocacy. right um right. i mean for those I, people I, who are going to be listening you know on the podcast and not watching us on the screen right and you know i was was um expelled from an entire school system um for my advocacy because i I mean, it escalated and escalated and escalated. As a matter of fact, I was um, having dinner about a year and a half, right, pre-pandemic, um, with the county manager and one of the people in the board of supervisors. Um, and um, the subject of my advocacy came up. Um, and the county manager had gone to the same middle school that I did. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, he said, I remember that riot. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I mean, I was mortified, mortified. Right. And he said, that was you? And I was like, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> but and then he was like, I remember you from middle school. He said, where were you in high school? <laughs> and I was like, about that. That right. was my was... being held accountable. That's why I, I didn't go to the same high school. And oh so, gosh. yeah, I was very much, but it was a very, you know, definite um, natural consequences still happening today for my advocacy because I did, I was held accountable. I, I 
you know, went to get some, some definite help for right. a good while. And um, when it was time for me to reenter the, the public school system, I had to go to a different high school in, in our county because the, they, they weren't sure that it would be a good idea for me to be mixing back in with the same old crowd. <laughs> um, so I ended up going to, to Hermitage High School and um, I'm very grateful. I mean, our my 35th reunion is in a couple of weeks, and I'm super excited about it. But, wow. um, yeah. So I was definitely, you know, held accountable. And at the same time, I also got the help that I needed. What you and, needed, right. Um, you know, got to go to camp for <laughs> about a year and a half. Camp. 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 Sleep away camp. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now I went to Virginia Treatment Center for Children back when it was part of the state um, hospital system for a, when it was like truly residential and, and saved my life. So wow. no more riots for um, elected officials to remember me by. <laughs> but yeah. Well, now you now, you know, and since then. Um, you, it's a, it's a more quiet riot if I can, you know, be a cheese ball, right? Like it's, it, the energy was just better directed, right? Like you have done, I'm sorry, I'm hearing myself. You're not echoing out here. Weird. Okay. Now I'm just really confused as to what. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. We will edit this out, but it's just so complicated. All right. And uh, Rob, if you can comment, please, to me um, to make sure to tell me whether or not we're echoing out in the universe. Mm -mm. Okay. He said no problem. Okay, good. So sorry. Please forgive me. Um, we, you are uh, engaged in a more quiet riot, and I realize that that's the you know band's name, and I'm hilarious. But um, totally. and I am, I am hilarious. There's no um, there's just ask no you. Deni there's no denying it. Just, just ask, ask me. me. Exactly. <laughs> um, I get all of my jokes, and that's um, what matters. <laughs> Sometimes um, I crack myself up, and that's it's, what matters. It's, it's so true. I, I have to live with myself 100% of the time. So if I'm not entertaining myself, then that's a problem. Um, you know, but it, it just goes to show that that energy can be redirected, right? Like that energy can be uh can can be uh, funneled more appropriately and i think it's Absolutely. so frequently so 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 frequently um kids who make these decisions very you know and yes the in some cases those kids turn into adults and you know continue to make those bad decisions and continue to you know to advocate inappropriately for themselves but so often that, you know, that foundation is built because of the fact that adults just just look at them and go, well, that's just, you know, that's not going to turn out well. So we're just going to get rid of them. You know, we're just we're not going to pay attention. We're not going to listen. We're going to, you know, put a label and walk away. And you are. I mean, you're an example in so many ways, but your lived experience is such that you know, like with support, with help, with the proper guidance, with, uh, you know, people who give a crap, um, you know, it is possible. To kick my butt. Right. And to hold you accountable in that way. Right. Um, you can, you know, become an example and a person who makes real change. So when did you realize that your, your voice could be used for good? Let's see. Um, I think um, p 
probably joining the rescue squad was a huge turning point for me because I, I started to, to realize that, you know, my, I had something I could contribute to the world, you know, right. that, that I could like early on, I, f- I felt like I needed to atone for my past kind of thing, but I, I really didn't have anything to atone for. Um, because I, I hadn't done anything wrong. I was a kid. It wasn't my fault. Mm-hmm. Um, took me a little while to, to grasp that concept. Um, <clears throat> but last, just last week I got there. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, I could do a whole episode. We could probably do a whole year on um, forgiving ourselves for shit we did when we were kids. Yeah, so. there was that one time when I spilled that milk. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> And then I cried for 30 years. Exactly. (laughs) Until I heard that don't cry over spilt milk and it changed my life. (laughs) No, no, I I really did. When I joined the rescue squad, I, I, I really felt like I had, you know, something to, you know, apologize to the world for. So I was like, you know, okay, let me, you know, do these good deeds for a little while. And then, you know, I'll be even with the world. And then, you know, 35 years later, (laughs) it, it, you know, kind of gets in your blood, I guess. But Mm -hmm. so I I really felt like, you know, I was doing something, you know, big then because I was like 16 and, and, you know, there's lights and sirens and and everything. Um, And I think early on in, in that experience, there were some, some times where, um, you know, I came across some, some different calls or whatever. And, you know, you're, you're kind of going into environments that, you know, most people don't, aren't invited into. Um, And there were some situations where it's like, you know, this isn't right. This isn't okay. Um, And so there were some time, a couple of times where I had to speak up and you know tell the authorities or tell at the hospital you know the physicians or the nurses about something that i had seen um and it made a difference in someone's life and it was like wow that was you know big um and so i started to to realize that you know i could be somebody else's voice um you know, that didn't necessarily have a voice. Um, And, you know, it didn't, nobody had to even know about it. And, but I didn't care. Um, And I think that was when I realized that, you know, I could make a difference for someone else and, you know, change their life for the better. Um, just by, you know, using my voice versus, you know, my skills as a, an EMT or then paramedic or whatever. Um, and that was, that was a pretty big turning point. Um, the first time that I, I did any sort of like advocacy on a kind of large, um, stage was, um, when, kind of like the the community service boards were needing funding um and um i went in front of the senate finance committee Mm -hmm. and i talked about um this might not have been the first time but it was probably one of the the, the biggest time, the first time that it really made an impact. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And I talked about how um, I had gotten help through the community service board, uh, this community service board, and how, um, you know, that just shifting money back and forth, you know, one year, you know, through the budgets wasn't going to help anything, you know, mm-hmm funding beds, one budget cycle, funding the CSB, the next budget cycle, it, you know, I don't know who balanced their checkbooks, but, um, that really didn't work. (laughs) 
<laughs> you know, that's not a, that's not a, a sustainable model. Yeah, it's like you, you can't float checks. <laughs> right. <laughs> I learned that in, I think it was called single living when I took that class in high school. <laughs> that right. They taught you that. Um, but no, I have a lot of respect for the folks in, in the General Assembly. Don't, don't get me wrong. However, that's what oh, was happening that makes back one of then. Us. Ooh, that, that was mean. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I really do. So it's, I know you do. It's a hard job. Um, and But anyway... They, literally every other budget they were you know moving the money back and forth and it really doesn't work when you do that um and so i i stood up and i told my own story about receiving help about how i literally would have been dead <laughs> if i had not gotten that help and how um it just so happens one of the people on the the, the finance committee at the time, um, I had um, given that person's son a job, his first job, um, and um, I told the the person that um, you know if if I was willing to take a chance on you know that person's son, that that I think that it was worth um he was the the head of the committee i, I think that it was you worth are good him taking a chance on um people like me and um when you get personal um and not in a digging mean hard bad way right like you know not digging up dirt or whatever but just being right. honest um <laughs> it's very impactful Right. And I would like to think that my, you know, standing up and t being very raw and honest about my experience and kind of speaking directly to one person that mm -hmm. had a very influential vote um, made a difference. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, it's funny because that's exactly my first, you know, experience with advocacy as well was at the General Assembly, not sharing my own experience, but working for the CSB and, you know, supporting the folks that we um, that we worked with uh, to to know how to share their experiences if they wanted to and to be able to stand up in that space and be heard by people in power, which very often, you know, the, the, the folks that are served by a community services board. And for anybody who doesn't know what a community services board, it is exactly what it sounds like. It is, you know, county agencies that, you know, are run by the county and receive state and federal funding as well, who, you know, provide uh, mental health care and disability support services for children, adults, prevention, early childhood, substance use, um, crisis, all of our crisis response um, programs are, are run through the CSBs. These are essential organizations in our communities that most people, unless you have access, unless you have to use them, most people don't even know they exist. And but they provide essential services for the people in the community who need them. Um, and they are chronically underfunded. And every year there is an opportunity for people in, in you know, communities of need in general to stand in front of the, the you know, Senate Finance Committee and stake their case, state their case about why funding directed toward this cause or that agency is the best way to utilize the uh, the General Assembly's resources, which are limited. And yes, I agree. It it is a hard job and I don't undermine it. Um, and I also get very angry with lawmakers in general. And I, you know, I'm not quiet about that um, because I do think that, you know, there's frequently, um, you know, a justification for not, not doing what needs to be done. And that's a whole nother conversation as well. Um, but giving people the opportunity to find their voice and helping them to, you know, to stand up in that space and be heard is incredibly empowering. 
um, for a lot of people. I also have this other this other part of me that that is mad that it has to happen because I do feel like it's unfair to ask someone who struggles so significantly with many different aspects of their life to make that effort and to put themselves on blast in that way and to share the rawest, you know, most difficult elements of their life, you know, for to have their basic needs met. It it really does frustrate me to no end. And at the same time, I've seen how empowering it can be to provide that space for somebody. So it really is, you know, it's this complicated space that you know, I, I, I think, again, we could talk about for a thousand hours. I think here in Virginia, um, I don't know much about other states and how their um, state legislator legislature works. I think they're but, all different. Yeah, but here in Virginia, I think it's it's a it's necessary because our <clears throat> legislators are even though it's it's a full-time commitment it's technically like a part-time job part-time job right and so they have you know other jobs and you know school teachers attorneys and doctors doctors right. nurses insurance nurses salesmen. um <laughs> nurses um you know farmers <laughs> right anything you can think of practically. So if, you know, I want something, a, a bill passed and it's, you know, it's on a subject matter that isn't a, a general knowledge kind of thing, they may have no earthly idea what the nuts and bolts of it are about. Mm -hmm. And so if, I don't take it upon myself to educate, you know, the, why is this important? Mm -hmm. You know, what is this going to do? Not just for me, Melissa early, but for the citizens of the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's going to benefit everybody or mm -hmm. a, a vast majority of people or a certain group that really needs, you know, the Commonwealth's support, then they're not going to know why it's important. Right. Because as an attorney, a teacher, or whatever, da, 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 they don't know, which is why doing advocacy is so important. And, and, why people from lots of different backgrounds are so needed to step up and do it. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of folks out there that, that do it and from different special interest groups from, you know, groups that represent kids and groups that represent nurses and groups that represent, you know, brain injury and mental health. And, you know, most of them, there are some that, you know, of course there's paid lobbyists and things like that, but, a lot of folks it, volunteers and right you know i when i was um it, it's called testifying for a bill whatever i was testifying for um a workplace violence bill for healthcare providers because it's really not okay if you don't get your um pain medicine when you want it versus when it's actually due to right. you know punch your nurse in the face it's really mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's not. frowned upon. Yeah. That's, yes. That's, um, yes uh, you know, you know, in kindergarten, you learned that's an inappropriate form of self advocacy. Correct. Mm -hmm. Correct. You don't talk with your hands like this. <laughs> you can talk with your hands like this or sign language, which I don't know. I mean, yes. this is slow, I think. Um, and this is airplane. That's about all I got. Um, the majority but, of people who listen to this are not going to be able to see you anyway. So it would it, you could be fully fluent in ASL and it wouldn't matter because they won't know. Good. Because, so. yeah, I'm not. <laughs> um, but, yeah. And and so I, I testified on two different occasions for, like, health, workplace violence bills on, for health care providers. Mm -hmm. um, 
you'd be very, you're, you may or may not be very surprised about how often right. that occurs. Mm -hmm. Very, way too frequently, and some of the cases are just horrifying. Um, right. But like, I mean, I, volunteering to do it, and one particular day, it happened to be, um, I think it was a budget day, and um, I, I got there like eight in the morning and stayed until like after four in the afternoon and had to come back because my bill didn't come up. Right. And so it's, you know, it's time consuming and things like that, but you know, it's important, especially like that issue is, is personal to me because, you know, I was, I was a, a victim of health of workplace violence as, as a nurse. And, you know, I'm very passionate about it. And, and, you know, the, the first bill that I testified for, um, and I didn't find this out until a couple years later when I was doing a presentation with um, one of the folks from one of the organizations that was kind of sponsoring the legislation. Um, I was up in front of the, the committee for at least like 20, 25 minutes or whatever. And apparently that's like unheard of. Um, usually it's like three minutes and you're out. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But there was like a back and forth with um, the senators and myself, you know, for a good while um, on the uh, battery, um, on a healthcare provider legislation in 2017. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't realize that that wasn't kind of normal the norm right yeah and and i found out um last fall when when i presented um at the vna's fall conference that you know um the person from the virginia hospital and healthcare association um that did the presentation at the fall conference with me she was like you know i've been doing this a long time and i've only seen that happen like a couple of times and i was like wow and she was like, yeah, and you, you held your own. And I was able to hold my own because of like a combination of my backgrounds. Like I, I had certain information through so many years in pre-hospital, like knowing about hospitals going on diversion and things like that. And, and, you know, knowing, like learning through school, like nursing school, you know, about the, you know, why like nurses might leave the profession and things like that. And, and mm -hmm. it's, you know, because of instances of workplace violence and right. things like that, right. and, you know, actually listening in class is important learning stuff like that. What? Um, yeah. You don't have what? to read the books. You don't have to read the books, but you do have to listen. <laughs> Please yeah. don't tell our, our uh, education seeking pre-medical professionals to not read the books when they're in school. I would like to be able to trust that I can, you know, be I'm not talking for. about textbooks. I'm not talking about textbooks. <laughs> Nope. You have to read about, your textbooks. You're not just talking about like Harry Potter. When cover. they assign Harry Potter in your nursing class, you you should you don't have to read that one. No, not Harry Potter. Okay. Gotcha. Okay, you, that's good. You can listen to that on audio book. <laughs> so I think you know it's it's really fascinating, and I, I you know I I, I want to just highlight what you're saying, which is basically that you know. It is entirely possible that every single one of us has a, a specific experience or series set of experiences that would make us, you know, quote unquote, an expert in something that you know, based on your lived experience, not mm -hmm. necessarily, you know, and yes, you have education and training and all of those things, but because you have this very unique set of experiences, one starting out as a consumer, moving into your experience in, you know, in, uh, on the rescue squad, and then as a nurse, and, you know, you, you bring to the table your unique set of experiences, which were essential in the you know creation of this I, it did pass right both both of them did and right from what i understand at least from the first one it was not expected to get out of committee 
which is the very, like the first stage. Right. And so you were, uh, you were integral because you showed up. Right. And, you know, so complexities aside, difficulties with, you know, should or should not a person be required to or expected to air their dirty laundry and the function of, you know, having a, 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 a law made. Honestly, like that's what if you could see me is it's like get up and mm -hmm. tell your story like when you're ready, when you feel prepared, right. when you feel OK and safe and all of those things healthy enough to, to do that. But your you, you know, the tagline of this episode, which came from you, but I also used in my um, in my TED talk a few years ago, your story can change the world. It can. I mean, it <laughs> and and the world can have many, many different definitions, right? The world right. can be however many bazillion people. Or it that, can be one person. Exactly. And, and the, the importance is, you know, is hang on. I got it. Trains coming in the station the the importance is subjective right. it's it's you know whatever it means to whoever it impacts mm -hmm. yep and that's yeah, what i was it, it's true it, it's it's 100 percent true and i think that you know we we do and you know we've talked about this before too we have a tendency to you know to value um I wrote in my book. I'll never forget. I wrote this in my book and the editor was like, this is this. You can't say this. Um, it's dumb. And I was like, it's who I am and I'm not changing it. Um, we have a tendency to value big giantness. And and I'm OK. It is dumb. But I but it's we don't dumb. we don't want to talk about the impact that one person's story can have on another single person. We don't want to understand that if somebody hears your story and it changes the way they do a single thing, you know, we know that the butterfly effect is a thing, right? This is, a, you know, the, the, the flapping of a butterfly's wings can change the entire trajectory of the weather, which can change, you know, so to to assume that your story can't why are you crying it's a good thing first off yeah. i'll start by that um recently i went through a really really hard time mm -hmm. and um just, I don't think a single star aligned for me over the past couple of months. And um, I bought some honey from a friend of mine and we met on her way back home from work um, for me, for us to make, you know, the exchange. Um, and we just kind of started talking and um i mean you know me i don't open up to a lot of people um it's kind of a trust <laughs> thing i have yeah uh -huh. and so. um but i opened up to her and um she said something you know you were talking about but whatever your dumb quote was would right. say it again you know we we only value big giantness right and um something that she said to me was um because i was talking about an opportunity that um was was it wasn't taken away but i wasn't it wasn't given to me um for reasons I didn't understand. And, and something that she said to me was, um, you know, you don't have to perform on a big stage mm -hmm. 
to make a difference. You don't right. have to, you know, be on the big stage to reach people. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it doesn't have to be that way, you know. Maybe you just need to sit with that one person. That's right. And to that, when you said that. Yep. So. Okay. I love you. I love you too. I'm giving you a hug right now from a distance. Ah, I wasn't supposed to cry. That gone. Well, you know, I am the Barbara Walters of podcasts. So <laughs> I, I, I don't consider any episode a success until somebody cries. Sometimes it's me, but you know, ah. I do think that you know, in our our world of virality right like everything has to happen on on the big stage right and so i mean for me personally so much of what i grapple with in the you know execution of the work that i do is like what what's more important right is it important for this show and this podcast and the if you could see me project to be this giant thing um, you know, or is the work that I do one-on-one with countless people every day enough is the, you know, is, and, and the answer is yes to all of it, right? Like it, it's ready to all, say yes, <laughs> right, exactly. Like, you know, the, the dialectic is true that, you know, both can be equally valuable and, we just have to know that right and Mm -hmm. i thank you for being vulnerable and thank you for you know for sharing that that story and for and for giving yourself the space to feel these emotions because they are they're all part of it right like life is hard like like Mm -hmm. really 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 hard And however we show up, however we're able to show up, is enough. Absolutely. And it's, um, kind of what started that whole kind of downward spiral was a situation where I couldn't advocate for myself. Mm Mm-hmm. We were talking about that kind of leading up to this podcast Mm -hmm. and I really felt like I, I should have been able to, and, and I, I just couldn't. And, you know, it's sometimes I don't understand how I can be so good at, you know, making things happen and, and, you know, speaking up on behalf of other people, on behalf of whole groups of people, you know, picking up the, the phone, which I think is a lost art. Um, (laughs) and, and agreed. Also for some of us, it is a severe anxiety provoking. You and I have this issue where you like to talk on the phone and I love you. And I have like, want to like gouge out my eyeballs every time I have to talk on the phone. So I love you. Go uh, ahead I, with your, with your Jewish mother <laughs> guilt about I'm not guilty. me not calling you enough. Ma. No, know, no, 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 no. <laughs> I'm talking about, <laughs> I'm, I'm not talking kidding. about personal phone calls, <laughs> but I mean like picking up the phone. Did and... I just take that personally? I'm sorry. I think I so. Um, I did. Yeah. It happens yeah. sometimes. Get over yourself. But anyway, um, <laughs> picking up the phone <laughs> and calling some place like CBS. Yes. Um, oh, no, I can't do that. And saying, you know, 
hey, um, I think you should do one of your CBS care spots on borderline personality disorder because nobody understands what that really is. Right. And most people think it's akin to the plague. And just so happened to be right in the middle of Superstorm Sandy, and I didn't realize it. So the person who answered the phone was like some top level executive versus, you know, the person who typically answers the phone. Right. And I, when I, I was like, and you were in Virginia, so you didn't know what was happening. Right. And, and we started talking and then she was like, you know, well, I was like, so you're answering the phone and, and cause she's like, well, the actually, yeah, that's my department. And I said, and you answered like the regular line. And she goes, well, I was one of the few people that got in because of the storm. And I went, Oh my gosh, can, can is there anything I can do to help? <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. I said, do you need to go? And she said, no, there's really not a lot to do right now. <laughs> I'm good. Let's chat. <laughs> but yeah, like doing things like that. It's like, I, I can do that. I can, you know, call um, University of Washington and, and end up talking to Marsha Linehan herself. Oh my um, gosh. Marsha Linehan, that, for people who don't know, is the creator of Dialectical Behavior Therapy. Dialectical Behavioral Therapy. Behavioral therapy. Yeah. Um, and like when I say I have her number in my phone contacts, you know, people look at me like, no, you don't. And I'm like, You're no, fancy. Really, really, I, I do. It's not like I would ever like call her again. Um, right. I can't think of a reason. I, I mean, like, it's not like I'm going to call her for coaching. <laughs> hey, what's up? Which is part of the DBT <laughs> right, model. the process, right. Um, it's like, I'm at my skills breakdown point, Marsha. I need your help. <laughs> that would be awkward. Um, but, I mean, doing things like that, yes, I'll do. But, you know, it's like when, when I'm in a situation where someone who I'm in, in this, like, program of a lifetime and someone who doesn't know me is making a completely unethical decision and I have nothing in me to fight with. Yeah. I got nothing. Right. And it literally almost cost me my life. Mm. And everybody I tell about it, they're like, Oh my God, that's horrible. How could one person do that? But that one person had power. Right. And it's not something that doesn't happen all the time. Right. And that's like a double negative. So what it that is something is, that happens, happens all the time. All the time. <laughs> right. Thank you for the translation. Yeah, sure. And it's scary that yeah. it happens all the time because right. like, there have been times where I've, I've been able to like advocate for myself, but I've in those times, it's like I've brought along a witness because I, I don't trust that if, if I don't have somebody there to vouch for me later that right. this happened and, and this person in a position of power, usually like in the medical field, mm -hmm. you know, admitted their mistake and righted a wrong, mm -hmm. then they can do the exact same thing. They can write whatever they want in my clinical notes. And if it's written down, it happened. Cause that's what I learned from day one. When you document something, that's what happened. Yep. Period. Yep. And there are a lot of people out there that have been, you know, stereotyped that have been, you know, put in hospitals that they shouldn't have been put in, that have been put out of hospitals that they shouldn't have been put out of. And I'm not saying that, that, that that's the norm, but it does happen more often than it should. Right. And right. it's scary. 
Well, and you know, so that is the, okay. Like as we reach the, the end of our time together today, like what's our, what's our homework? Like, how do we walk away feeling like we can, we can do something here. Um, and I think that, you know, how many of us take a witness with us when we go to something, you know, a doctor, a provider, a situation where we can be, right, where we can be challenged. So for those of you listening, Melissa just held up her phone. Um, you know, we have to, we, we have to be able to hold people in power accountable. And sometimes that means doing stuff that feels, you know, extra or, or weird, especially if you're someone who has, you know, um, if you're someone who has a mental health diagnosis, in many cases you get, you know, they look at you like, are you sure this isn't mental health related? Are you sure this isn't, you know, an anxiety issue? Are you sure you're taking your meds? When was the last time you saw your psychiatrist? You know, I'd, and I've, I've said this on this show a thousand times, you know, when I was having problems with my eyes last year, which have persisted, um, you know, I was told that it, it could be a result of my anxiety. <laughs> that that uh, vitreous gel detachment in my eyeballs was, you know, was just me being crazy. Um, Sounds crazy so, to me. Yeah. And, you know, I no, had the doesn't. wherewithal and the capacity in that moment to, you know, assert myself and say, you know, I know, I, you know, I know what I'm seeing and, and to be able to calmly respond and, uh, you know, but I've been in that situation a hundred times since I was seven years old. Um, when I started having, you know, medical issues and have been undermined at, you know, a thousand times and don't trust my body and don't trust myself to trust what's going on with myself in many cases. And so, again, this is another issue, but self-advocacy sometimes can be a thousand times harder than advocating for someone or for advocating for a group. Um, you know, when it is directly related to us, it is... Um, it's, it's my identity that you're, that you're undermining. It's my ability mm -hmm. to understand my body. And when you tell me what I'm feeling isn't happening, um, you know, I was reading about somatic, um, symptom. Oh, it has the, a different name. Oh, uh, somatic. Um, <sighs> it's in the DSM. Um, it's, it's typically happens in um, when somebody comes from another country to, I know what you're talking about, because it's, it's, it's a, it's a mental health, it's a mental health symptom that presents as a physical symptom. Right. Or it is a physical issue that has not yet found a medical diagnosis. And so it's very often um, mistaken for or mixed up with hypochondria, hypochondria, right? Like we think that it's all in the person's head. And so it was created with the intention of sort of replacing hypochondria because hypochondria is not, you know, um, a made up thing. It's a fear of becoming ill. It's a fear of, I could have this, I might have that. Um, and not knowing because we can't see inside of our bodies, whereas somatic symptoms are, you know, they're, they're real and we're experiencing them. They just don't necessarily have a medical diagnosis yet. Um, and so, and also they can be physical symptoms that are presenting as a result of a, of a, a mental health cause, like, you know, headaches or stomach aches when you have, you know, serious anxiety or, you know, things like that. So, um, but, um, I can't remember why I brought this up, <laughs> Melissa. You were um, talking about, you're reading about, and I think it's somatoform disorder. Uh, that, that is, 
there there are a couple of diagnoses and i'm gonna have to go back and look because i saw that right disorder now. undifferentiated somatoform disorder anyway yeah, yeah. so when, when physical, physical symptoms and, and mental arise, health collide right. so there is an there was an effort this is my point um, there was an effort to improve communication between physical health and mental health um, integration uh, so that doctors and mental health providers had language for, you know, I'm showing up in your space telling you that I have a physical condition. My body is not doing what it's supposed to do. Help me figure it out. And we still are often faced with countless circumstances in which, you know, people are undermined, their experiences are undermined, the power, the people in power say, well, because you have had this life lived experience, um, even in mental health settings, as you, you know, have, have explained, even in mental health settings, it is, you know, people are invisible. And mm -hmm. so, you know, I don't want to be the guy that says record all of your doctor appointments and record your therapist and, you know, do all of that. But if you don't feel safe and you don't feel seen or heard, um, bring a witness, whatever that witness is. It's, you know, it's not in your head. It, it, it very often is, you know, whether it's, um, it's implicit bias that a professional has against a person who, you know, has a certain lived experience, a certain diagnosis. Um, very often they just, they, they're part of their brain turns off and it's okay to speak up for yourself. And it's also okay to ask for help if you can't. And that's the, you know, that's, I think the, the, the sort of ending point is, you know, like, sometimes we can't advocate for ourselves because it's too close. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I I'm hear you saying that you don't want to be the, the person that says to record your doctor's appointments or whatever. Well, all yeah. of them, like, all of them. you know, I don't want, I, you know, I, I, and therapy maybe I'm stuff, wrong in that. Well, your therapy right. stuff, like, I mean, many therapists if, will record sessions their themselves with permission it depends on yeah. what type of therapy it is or whatever but as far as like you know medical visits mm -hmm. i record mine because i have a tbi right. and i may not remember what my provider is telling me and you know they may tell me you know take you know uh, uh do an epsom salt bath and i may here, you know, do a, a, you know, take some bath salts and that would right. be bad to mix up right. the two because right. I could go to jail. Um, I'm <laughs> kidding. That's a very extreme example. Right. But, but you record so that you can remember back to what they said. Right. And mm -hmm. it's okay because the only person's privacy that needs to be protected in that appointment is, is mine. So if I choose to record my medical visits, it's up to me. And in Virginia, right. it's a one party state. So as long as one person in the room, which is me, knows it's being recorded. Right. It's legal. Fine. And I'm going to be the one that keeps control of that recording. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if it happens to come up later that, you know, I have encountered a provider that, you know, is in that group, that, you know, minority group of those that may or may not be able to be trusted and right. is trying to, you know, impugn my integrity, mm -hmm. then maybe I'll have to use that recording for a different reason, but I'll have it. Right. Exactly. You know, I'm not going to put it out there to, you know, trash somebody's reputation or whatever. But, you know, I, I may have to use it to say, look, you know, Dr. Jekyll, um, this is what you actually said. So right. you need to change my clinical notes to reflect what really happened. Mm -hmm. Because I don't do bath salts. Right. I do Epsom salt baths. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> and and right. And it's possible, you know, we live in a world that has always said, well, doctors don't make mistakes. You know, you must have heard wrong. He, they must they could not possibly have said that incorrectly and so this is the function of like well no they're human and yeah. we don't need to assume that every medical professional or every person in power in our life is bad or evil no. or going to you know wanting to do just as we were talking about with the general assembly before right you know, we can assume that they're human and they also are allowed to be held accountable uh, you know, in mm -hmm. the dispensation of their Craft. rules and laws and all of that <laughs> stuff. Exactly. So, um, you know, it's okay to advocate for ourselves by holding other people accountable, no Correct. matter who they are. And as long as we are advocating for ourselves in a way that is, you know, that uh, the people are able to actually hear it, then, you know, here we are tying everything back to the beginning, right? Like if you need a certain kind of attention and you're not getting it, let's figure out how to help you get it the right way in a way that's actually going to get you what you need rather than just, you With, know. In an effective way. Yes, exactly. With effective. Because exactly. The, the, I mean, I, I'm not criticizing you using the word right. I just, when, you know, quantify or. Right. What's, what's right, what's right or right. wrong. Exactly. That's right. hard to do for, exactly. for me. Is, no, I, is, you're right. And is thank something you for of, holding of, me out for that. Yeah. Is something effective as in, right. is this working for you or mm -hmm. is it not effective and you're not getting your needs met? Exactly. So I would rather go with effective and get my needs met better use of of words and i and i appreciate that and you're you're right <gasps> uh, i know you know and it's it's being recorded i know it's <gasps> now it's it's true and and there's proof that it happened because just because i'm recording this whole thing I'm just kidding. <laughs> hey guess what so am i amazing all right, my friend. Um, I so appreciate you. Um, your words of wisdom, your lived experience, your um, just unmatched intellect are um, make my life better and make countless other people's lives better as well. And I love you. I love you too. And thanks for having me. Um, I wish you hadn't made me cry, but um, you actually didn't. Um, my amygdala did it, but hey, that's right. I don't take I pr I provided a you know a, a host like a, a good environment for tears to produce, but you know um, your your brain works the way it's supposed to in that regard. There's one place in that regard, right? Exactly. That was that was mean of me. I'm sorry. No, it think, wasn't. It was I it think, was funny. <laughs> I think your brain is one of the most incredible brains I've ever encountered. So, um, you know, you. whatever, whatever doesn't do what it's supposed to do is made up for by all the absolutely incredible ways that it that it makes makes life better. So thank you so much. Thank you to everybody for joining us. Join us again next week. Um, much love. Have an amazing week and we'll see you soon. Alrighty. Be well, everybody. Bye. Bye.